All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining in today's webinar. We're going to talk about multifamily due diligence from start to finish. In my opinion, whenever you're, you're looking at a property, there's a lot of different things you have to watch out for and you have to do due diligence correctly or otherwise you could set yourself up for failure. So in today's webinar, we're going to go into a lot of things when it comes to doing due diligence on the T12, doing due diligence on the rent roll, doing due diligence on the property itself when you're touring it, doing due diligence on the neighborhood, and that's all before you get under contract. And then afterwards, there's another type of due diligence, which is after you get under contract. Because once you get under contract, at that point, you've got hard money, you've got a deposit in there. And so um, you, you have to make sure you get you know, 80% of your due diligence done before you even get under contract on a property. So we're gonna talk about that. And then we're going to talk about the second part, which is, hey, you're under contract. What do you do to make sure you inspect all the property, the, the units, the roofs, the foundations, the plumbing, all these different things. And then obviously also audit financials. So I'm going to start sharing my screen and we're going to go over it step by step. Now, for those that have not made an investor account, what we do is uh, basically we, we source multifamily investment opportunities and the currently in the Dallas market. And with these investment opportunities, basically you, you get to invest alongside us directly, you get monthly cash flow, and then our target is to double investors' money every three to five years. So if you're interested in, in looking at our future deals, go, uh, go ahead and write the, scan this QR code, and then you'll be able to see our future deals. I'm gonna put the link in the chat right now. It takes like two seconds to sign up. It's very, very easy. And then from there on, you're gonna be able to see our future properties. So there we go, I'm gonna put that in the chat. So go ahead and sign up while, while we're doing this. But for those that don't know me, uh, just to kind of give you a quick intro, my name is Abbas Mohammed. I started in real estate back in 2017 as a real estate agent initially. And then uh, over four and a half years later, basically I, I became one of the top 50 agents in the country with Remax. I had 25 full-time assistants and my business was doing between one and a half to $2 million a year in profit. And so I was accumulating a lot of money in the bank. And, and at a, some point, I think two years ago, roughly, I wanted to start investing that cash somewhere. So I looked at a lot of different assets. I looked at single family. I looked at the stock market. I looked at um, crypto, but I really didn't like any of it because it was too volatile. And, you know, especially with like single family and everything like that is it was very hard to manage and very hard to scale up. And so after continuing to look for investment opportunities, I eventually decided to start investing in multifamily real estate. And so, so far, um, you know, I'm currently invested in over 1500 apartments passively, and we also own $54 million in assets in multifamily as general partners. So, uh, you know, we're continuing to scale up. My goal for this year in 2023 is to get to 150 million. And so that's kind of what we're focusing on. Multi multifamily value add deals and growing markets like the Dallas market, or hopefully in the future, we'll also go into Phoenix and Nashville and a bunch of other markets. But that's kind of what we do. So in this webinar, again, we're gonna talk about due diligence from start to finish. But first I wanna explain for those that are newer in this business, what is due diligence in multifamily? So again, in multifamily due diligence is really kind of divided into two different pieces. There's due diligence prior to you writing an offer. And that consists of three different parts. Number one is the financials due diligence, because what happens is when you're looking at a property, the first thing that you'll get from a broker is the financials. So you're going to get the T12, you're going to get the rent roll. And so you have to understand how to do due diligence on that, which we're going to talk about in a bit later on. The second thing is after you look at the financials and you, you like the deal, you like the numbers, then you go on a tour of the property to check it out in person and see if it's something that you're actually interested in. And that's where you do the property tour due diligence. So I'm going to explain that as well uh, in a bit. And then after you finish the property tour, then you have to do the neighborhood due diligence where you're checking out the neighborhood to see if it's the right or the wrong neighborhood for what you're kind of looking to do. And then that's all prior. Again, that's prior to you writing an offer. Then after you get your offer accepted, then there's the second phase of due diligence. And that's the actual property inspections. These are super, super important because if you don't do this, you can set yourself up for a lot of trouble as you, as you go on. So we're gonna talk about how you do property inspections and what you should be focusing on. And then finally, the financial auditing. So when, whenever you're looking at a deal, the first thing that they give you is they give you the T12, which is basically the profit and loss statement. 
and then they give you the rent roll. But the truth is a lot of these numbers are not audited and a lot of times you might see inconsistencies. So when you get a property under contract, that's when you go and you actually pull up the bank statements and you pull up the actual records to make sure that the financials that they gave you are the way that they're supposed to be. So we're gonna talk about how you could do that as well by the end of this, but by the end of this webinar, you'll understand exactly how to do due diligence and you know watch over some of the pitfalls and mistakes that other people make on a on a common basis that you should be avoiding so having said that uh, let's start this off by talking about the financial due diligence let's talk about the underwriting phase so this is when you first hear about a deal when a broker sends you a deal they will send you the t12 and they'll send you the the rent roll when you get the t12 it's going to look something like this if you look on the right it's basically a list of all of the income and a list of all of the expenses line by line in different categories. And so what you want to do a lot of times, this is what I notice, especially newer people do, is that they look at the total income and then they look at the total expense and that's it. They just kind of move on and they don't really do much. But the reality is, you know, that's too basic. If you're looking to buy, you know, a multi-million dollar property, you have to do a lot more due diligence than just that. So what we do is we go through this line by line. Like we're literally reading all of these line by line, month by month, because we're trying to understand what are they spending money on, right? And we're trying to see if they have any off charges. What I mean by that is like, for example, you might look at a property and then you might look at the water bill and for some reason, the water bill is way, way, way higher than normal. So if it's way higher than normal, what could that tell you? Well, it could tell you that maybe they have leaks. Maybe they have water issues. Maybe you look at the, the you know, the repairs on, on the property and you see that, you know, every, every few months they might have a big jump in expenses. That might tell you that every few months they might, they might be having a big plumbing issue that they keep fixing, or maybe they keep having an, an HVAC issue that they keep fixing. So what you want to do whenever you're going through a T12, right, which is the profit and loss statement, is you want to write down all of the odd charges that you're seeing, because then you want to go back and talk to the broker about what you're, what you're seeing that's, that's incons inconsistent with what it should be because you want to get further clarifications. If you don't do that, you might be missing out on finding out about potential problems. Like I was looking at a deal, uh, I think it was like six, seven months ago. And uh, we just, we noticed multiple times where, where basically we would see higher water charges. And then they had multiple times where they would pay bills to, to fix the plumbing. And so we went on Google reviews and then on the Google reviews, people were talking about how water keeps getting shut off every few months. So then we call the broker and we say, hey, you know, this is kind of what we're noticing. Do you know anything about this? Obviously, the broker is going to pretend like they don't know anything about it. So then, you know, they went and checked, quote unquote, and then they came back and said, hey, you know, they, they have this water issue, but it should be fixed by now. But the truth is, if it was fixed, why do they keep why do they keep having to pay for it? Right. Why do they keep having to pay for the repair? So things like that you want to watch out for. Otherwise, you might get stuck buying a property and you might not have five thousand seven thousand ten thousand dollars every two months to to repair the the plumbing or whatever other issue that you might have uh, obviously we already talked about higher than average expenses what we like to do is we have different expenses so all these expenses that you see here we have categories on our own excel sheet and we write down exactly in, in the in the market what the typical charges are if we notice that the charges are higher than normal higher than what's typical we want to inquire about those because there might be an issue with the property. The second thing you want to look for is the rent roll. So when you're looking at the rent roll, you know, you want to watch out for short term leases, three months, six months, nine months. A lot of times what uh, what uh, property owners do is that they might fill up a unit before they sell it with a bunch of short term leases that are three months long, six months long, nine months long, because the short term leases usually bring in higher rent and so that might make the rent look higher when you're looking at the property but the truth is you should disregard those and you should only look at rents that are 12 months long because those are the rents that your property management company will be trying to get and uh, those are going to be the most consistent so just watch out for short-term leases because again those if you're charging 1500 on a 12 month lease you might be able to get you know 1750 or you know 1800 or 1900 dollars on a three month lease so if you look at that and then you base your entire business plan on the fact that you're going to get 1800 but really you can only get 1500 then the whole deal could completely blow up so you want to watch out for things like that as well in the rent roll and you also want to watch out for moving dates 
Um, if you notice a lot of people moving out and most of the most of the art world has brand new people every single every single year, then you want to understand why is there such high turnover. So these are things you want to make sure that you focus on as you're going through the financials, as you're going through the T12 and the art world. If you have any questions, post your questions in the chat and we will answer them by the end of this. So moving on from this, the other things that you wanna watch out for, this is when you're going on a property tour specifically, is you wanna look at the foundation. This is the number one most expensive thing that you could probably encounter in a property. So anytime you're going to a property, what you wanna do as you're touring it, and this is with a broker, without a broker, whatever the case is, you want to see signs of foundation cracks. So as you're going through the property, you want to see, do they have cracks on the foundation? Do they have cracks on the walls? Because if, if they do, and you see that over and over again, then that might mean you might have a foundation issue uh, that you'll have to deal with. Another issue is ACs. So I actually, just to give you an example of AC issues, one time I went to a property where the property was supposed to have uh, you know, individual ACs for every single unit. So everybody has control of their temperature. And that was, you know, apparently that was like replaced a year ago. So there was no problem with it. But then when I went to the property, what I noticed is that actually, let me share the picture. I believe I have a picture of this right there. So I noticed on all of the windows, they had window AC units. So I asked the broker, I'm like, listen, I have a question. If the AC was repaired last year, why do they keep having window units in literally almost like 90% of the units that I saw? And he didn't have an answer to that. But when they have AC units like this, window wall units, that just tells you that the actual AC, the, the central AC in the property is not functioning properly. We went on the Google reviews and we noticed throughout the past few years, people have constantly complained about AC not functioning correctly. So that's an issue. Another issue is you might notice, like if you go on a tour, you might notice something that looks like this, where you might have four AC units or two AC units, and you might notice one of them is brand new, kind of like this, and then the other ones are older. What that tells you is that the older ones are failing. And so they're, you know, slowly replacing them to the new ones as they fail. So if you look at a property like this, you might budget that you might have to replace 50%, 60%, 70% of the remaining AC units. So again, these are very, very important details. If you don't know that you should watch out for these things, you might end up uh, not noticing and that could cost you again, a lot of money when you buy a property. Plumbing is a huge, huge issue. One time I remember I went on a tour where I saw that they were digging tunnels and the idea behind, when they're digging tunnels like that, it's basically, you know, they were bringing in new plumbing, copper plumbing and all that sort of stuff. But again, a lot of times with older properties, they have, iron, they have galvanized iron. And so what happens with these properties is that the plumbing starts to belly down and then you have like these huge issues with the plumbing and that could cost you $500,000, $600,000, $700,000 on a big property, which again, could completely ruin your deal. So again, plumbing is a very, very big thing. Roof and multifamily, depending on which market you're investing in, the roof might have to get replaced every, you know, seven years to 10 years. And so again, that's a very, very big expense. So you wanna watch out, you know, as you're doing the tour, does the roof look old? Does it look beaten? Um, am I noticing that it's already starting to peel off of the actual um, off of the actual roof? So these are different things that you have to watch out for. And if you don't, again, you could cause yourself a lot of issues. This is what a foundation problem might look like. Sometimes, by the way, you might not notice the cracks on the actual bottom, but you might notice cracks all over the bricks right in between the bricks. If you notice that, then that means that the property um, is having foundation issues. The third thing is neighborhood due diligence. So whenever you find a property, let's say you look at the financials, you like the financials, you look at the property in person, you like it in person as well. The next thing you wanna do is you wanna do the neighborhood due diligence. Uh, we like to use citydata.com, it's completely free and it gives you the income and the demographics of that specific area, which are very, very helpful because if I'm looking to buy a property, my, one of my requirements is I have to see $40,000 a year of income or higher. And if I don't see that, then I'll just move on to something else. But I do this way before I even take a look at the property in person. That's probably one of the first steps I do. But another thing that you might do is you, you know, if you live far away from the property, like I live in California, we buy in Dallas. So if I find a property that I like before I go see it in person, I'm gonna go on Google Maps and I just change it into street view. 
And so then I just kind of start going through the neighborhood. I want to see what's going on, uh, what's going on in the neighborhood. I want to see if, if I could see any signs of crime. Sometimes I see signs of like, um, you know, people not wearing shirts or whatever. The minute I see that, I'm, I'm out of the neighborhood. Um, sometimes I see iron fences, iron chain fences on houses. If I see that, again, I'm out of the neighborhood. Um, so those things could save you a lot of time before you even step foot outside of your house. Google Maps is, is a huge, huge help. But then if you look at it on Google Maps, you look at it on City Data and you like it, that's when you then want to go out and drive it around in person. So what you want to do is, again, when you drive around, if you see any signs of crime, like graffiti, gang signs, whatever, you want to stay out of those step neighborhoods. Um, you also want to look at amenities. So I go to the property and then I type in restaurants. I want to go see where the restaurants are at. Then I want to go see where the shopping plazas are at. You know, if I want to go buy groceries, am I going to have to drive 20 minutes or is it a five minute drive? That could make a very, very big difference um, in my decision on whether I buy a property or not. I, I don't want to be in the boonies. I don't want to be on the outskirts. So I want to be close to different amenities. I also want to be close to schools. So, you know, I'll put down the addresses of the closest elementary, middle school, high school, go check them out in person. Because again, a lot of people will decide to live somewhere based on the school that they're looking at. So again, that's that's huge as well. Um, I also like to do this. I go and visit other competing properties in person. And what I do is I basically pretend to be a tenant. I just go in and say, hey, you know, I'm moving from California and I just want to check out where the rents are at. Uh, you know, take let me take a look at your one bedroom. Let me take a look at your two bedrooms. What is the classic charging? What is the premium charging, right? Uh, because I want to figure out what are they actually charging because the number that you might see online on their website could be very different than the number that they actually give you in person. A lot of times uh, the numbers that you see online are just not updated, right? And so they're, they're, <clears throat> they're kind of outdated. So you want to go in person. I pretend to be a tenant. Some people like to just be up front and say, hey, I'm looking to buy a property nearby. Um, you could do either, right? Um, so it's it's completely completely up to you. I found more success with pretending to be a tenant, but you want to be careful uh, by not using industry language. Like I will not say, "Hey, show me your classic units." I'll say, "Hey, show me some units that are maybe not updated that I could get cheaper per month." Because you know, I don't want to spend too much money, right? Um, so that's that's kind of how you want to do it. Um, that will give you the best results because they, you know, they'll show you around as if you're an actual tenant. Um, Another thing that I like to do is I like to visit shops in the area and just kind of ask them what they think about living here, if they live locally. So I'm like, hey, what do you think of this neighborhood? Do you notice any issues? Um, if you were to buy a house, would you be buying a house here? Um, could you see yourself living here long term? And so, you know, sometimes you might go and you might ask these questions and the things you hear from people might shock you and you might decide just based on that, that you're not going to be investing in that neighborhood. So. Um, I highly recommend this, like just to kind of give you an example, the Atlanta market is, is a market that a lot of people invest in. I visited Atlanta in person and I asked a bunch of Uber drivers what they thought and they all consistently said the same thing and that is, look, uh, the crime's too high, we constantly see crime. And so I decided to stay out of the mar out of that market and, uh, and I'm glad I did because I'm looking at the reports now and, and rents are rapidly dropping. There's a lot less population growth out there right now, but that's just an example, right? But you could do the same thing not just on the market, but on a specific neighborhood. Like I remember the last uh, property we bought, we went and visited the gas stations, I visited a T-Mobile store, I visited a restaurant, uh, because all of these are basically normal people that could potentially be your tenants, and so they will give you their, their actual opinions. If you have any questions, again, post them in the chat, and I'll be happy to answer them. So property inspections, uh, this is another thing. Now, after you do the neighborhood due diligence, if you decide to move forward with the property and you actually get your offer approved, that's when you start doing the real physical property inspections. And so the way it works is this. My recommendation is that you hire third party inspectors and you want to hire people that are specifically focused on multifamily real estate. If you can't find them, just ask your property management company because a lot of times they, they have connections and they have a lot of relationships that, that they could point you to or they might have their own team in-house. So like the management company that we work with, half of the team is in-house that does the inspections and then the thing is that they don't cover directly, they have relationships with people so they bring those in. And what you wanna inspect during those inspections is you wanna inspect the roof 
Again, the roof is a big, big expense. And so you want to make sure that if you're, if you're going to buy a property, it's fine if it has roof issues, right? That's not a big deal as long as you know about it and you budget for it up front. But if you buy a property and you have no idea that it has a roof issue and then all of a sudden you have to come up with half a million dollars just to replace the roofs, then that could put you in a lot of trouble. So uh, definitely make sure that you get the roof inspected. Same thing with plumbing. Um, again, that property I told you guys about that was having plumbing issues, I had a contractor come out and they said it was going to cost between half a million to $750,000 to fix the plumbing, to, to replace all the plumbing to copper. So again, that could be very, very expensive depending on the size of the property. Um, AC, same thing. So have them check out the AC, have them check out the foundation. Um, you want to make sure that they also check out the exteriors, right? So the exteriors of the property. And then most importantly, you want to make sure that you go through every single unit that they have on site. So whenever we're doing a property inspection, we literally walk 100% of the units of the property that we're buying. Usually you want to make sure that you also budget enough time for this. If you have 100 units, then that will take a day. If you have 200 units, that usually takes two days, right? So that's, that's just kind of um, the way that works. So roof, plumbing, AC, foundation, exteriors, and interiors. Basically the whole thing. Moving on from property inspections, uh, financial auditing. So again, this is the point where you actually match up the financials that they gave you up front with the financials that they actually have on site and all, and you know all these other things that they that they should be able to give you. So the best way to, to audit financials is to have a property management company do it because they audit a lot of different properties and a lot of different financials. They will do a way, way, way better job than you could ever do. And so, Highly recommend that whoever you work with, have them um, go through the whole thing, have them go through the T12, which is again, the profit and loss statement, have them go through the rent roll. Uh, they will also go through the current tenant applications. So what they will do is they'll say, hey, we have, let's say 80 tenants here, and they basically go through all of their applications to make sure that you know the, the previous owner didn't just fill up the units with, with crappy tenants just to be able to sell it, right? Um, so they will do, uh, they will basically audit all the current tenants that live on the property. They'll go through the bank statements to make sure that, hey, you're saying that you're charging for this. Um, am I actually seeing that on the income or is it something that you're just putting on the T12 that that's not actually coming into the, to the property bank account? So they'll audit all of that as well. It's very, very important that you make sure that you do this correctly because if you don't, you could, you know, you could get tricked and lose a lot of money. So make sure that you follow this correctly. Um, I want to pause this now just to answer any questions and then we'll go back and continue on with this because I want to make sure I don't move too fast. Um, if you have any questions, post them in the chat and uh, we'll go back and continue on with this. Let's see, we have a bunch of questions already. Let's see. Uh, let's see, let's see. Oh, these are just people introducing themselves. Uh, do you outsource your view and due diligence of the profit and loss statement and financial documents to a CPA accountant, for example? So we outsource that to the property management company. So they basically come in and again, they, they do all of, all of that in person. Uh, they usually have a team. So if you're, if you're working on a property, they might bring in you know, between five to 10 people uh, to do all of this work. Any other questions, post them in the chat. Happy to answer any questions you guys might have. Or you could just talk. Don't matter. Um, hey, a follow-up question. So on the due diligence of the financial documents, like the property management company, I knew you said it's usually a team. Timeline-wise, does that slow down deals for you when they're reviewing it? Do they usually turn that around pretty quickly for you? Yeah, so usually, you know, they'll, they'll take about five days, you know, to kind of give you the, the whole thing from start to finish. Um, so what they'll do is, after you get under contract on the property, they'll send their people out. So, you know, they'll take a day or two to do the actual inspections and run the reports. And then about two days later, they'll send you all of the, all of the information back to your email. Um, usually you have 30 days to do inspections after you get under contract on a property, obviously, as long as you put that in the, in the deal up front. So that's, that's plenty of time. That's usually not a problem. Um, what you have to do though before you get under contract is is time sensitive because you don't want to take too long to go see a property you don't want to take too long to go uh, tour the neighborhood because if you do then they'll just sell it to somebody else so that's usually where you could lose deals hope that helps how do you vet your property management company um good question how do you vet management companies so the way i do it 
is I basically go on apartments.com. Actually, I'm just going to show you what I do right now. I go on apartments.com like this. And then I, I just type in the market where the property is located. Let's just kind of use this zip code, I guess, as an example. I'm doing this live. There's no preparation for this. So I'll just kind of show you. So what I do is basically, let's, let's say I'm buying a property in this area, for example, right over here. Then I'm going to look at this and say, okay, so who is competing with me? Obviously, all of these properties now are competing with me. I'm going to change this to apartments because really that's kind of what we're buying. Um, and so then I will look at these properties and see who has um, the highest rents, who has the best reviews, who has the best marketing. So I'm going to open up, for example, Tides, right? So if I look at this Tides deal, I love the way that they have this set up online. A lot of management companies don't put as much effort in their pictures. So they've done a great job with this. Um, it looks very clean. I'm going to go down to the description. Um, okay, cool. So all of this stuff is updated which looks nice. Um, so then what I do is I basically make a list. I say, okay, so Tides, I like them. I want to check them out. And then I go here and I'm like, okay, S2 Residential, I'm going to check them out. So it seems like in this in this neighborhood, Tides has two deals. S2 Residential has one, WBA has one. Tides has a third deal. Okay, interesting. So Tides seems to have um, a big presence over here. So they might know the market very well. So I will reach out to them. But on top of reaching out to them, I will also visit their properties in person that, that are located here. And again, when I pretend to be a tenant, I want to see how do they treat me as a tenant? Do they pick up my calls? Do they reply to my emails? Are they, you know, when they show me around the units, are they trying to basically get me to lease or are they just kind of opening the door and, and not doing anything? So I want to see how they're trained. So that's how I do it because whenever you're signing a contract with a property management company, you're signing usually a 12 month long contract. And if you choose the wrong company, they could completely ruin your deal. Um, have you done an early access agreement? If so, what's that like compared to a traditional due diligence period? So for those of you that don't know what an early access agreement is, it's basically saying, look, I'm going to be buying this deal and I'm going to put up 100,000 of non-refundable deposit. But before I do that, I want to actually bring in my property management company to do all the inspections before my, my earnest money becomes non-refundable. Um, usually when you do that, it becomes a lot harder for you to be able to get the deal under contract because other buyers might not be as, um, as speaky about that. Um, I have not done it like that. I've always based, because I've seen, I mean, hundreds of properties. So if I go to a property, I could easily, you know, see the big mistakes or problems that I should watch out for. Um, so I haven't really needed to do that. And also my partner has been in construction for like 30 years now. So he, he could identify problems very, very easily while we're doing a tour. Um, you could do it, but I think it would hurt your chances and you might have to give up other terms or pay a higher price just to get early access. And in my opinion, that's just not worth it. Unless I'm worried about a property. If I'm worried about a property, then I will absolutely do that. Um, for the review that the property manager conducts as a part of due diligence, is there an added cost to the buyer GP team or is it typically covered by the seller? So he's asking if, if the property management company is doing these inspections, do they charge anything or is it free? And no, they, they do charge, it's usually about $5,000 to $6,000 for the due diligence. A lot of times, if you hire the same company to actually take over the property and manage it for you, sometimes they will give it to you for free, so they'll waive their cost. Um, that that's not always the case. Um, I know with our management company, they if if we hire them to do the deal, they will you know they'll do it for free. But if we hire someone else, they'll charge us five grand. So it just kind of depends. Uh, what is a simple rule you can screen potential multifamily investments before you look at gross rent multiplier, NOI cap rate? etc. Um, so BK, uh, one of my biggest things before I even look at the financials or anything else on a property is I'm looking at the market. It has to fit my market criteria. Um, so for me, you know, I want to see population growth. I want to see rent growth. I want to see appreciation and I want to see a landlord friendly market. So for me, that's Dallas, Phoenix, Nashville, right? Uh, the Tampa market is great, but currently I'm just focusing on Dallas. So that's number one. The second thing is I want to see neighborhood income of $40,000 or higher per year. And that's on city data. 
Um, and then after that, I want to see that the property is a 1980s deal plus uh, B class asset. It has to be a value add deal, which means that after we buy it, we have to be able to renovate it and increase rents. Um, and I'm not just buying something that, you know, that I'm hoping will automatically grow in value on its own. So those are kind of my requirements before I spend any time. Let's see, any other questions? How long are the due diligence periods for different unit numbers, like 100, 200, 350 units? Um, generally speaking, it's all the same, you know, whether it's 100 unit, 300 unit, doesn't matter. Uh, you know, obviously you negotiate that, it's all negotiable, but generally speaking in your contract and your offer, you put in, hey, I want 30 day inspection. Um, and then during those 30 days, you know, you just kind of set up a time and you let them know, hey, you know, we're going to need about three days to actually go through the entire property. So then, then what they do is they send out notices to all the tenants, letting them know, hey, uh, between this day to this day, you're going to have people come into your unit, check it out, go out. If you don't give them the dates, you can't really go into the unit. So it's just as simple as that. Any other questions, post them in the chat. Happy to answer any questions. I hope this is helpful for you guys. Hopefully this will help you guys avoid some problems as you're buying deals. Uh, let's see, let's see, maybe I missed a question. Let me just go back. Are you considering Are you considering a good mix of front upside and ARV or weigh one consideration over another? Um, I know we covered this a little on class A, B, and C webinar. So for me, what matters the most is what is the what is the potential upside of income because the the deal is valued based on its income so if i'm looking at a deal and i can't raise the 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 income and i can't reduce the expenses then i just won't buy it because sometimes you might look at a deal and even though it might not have any cosmetic upside to it for example maybe there is a management upside meaning it's just not being managed correctly and so like we just bought a deal right now and uh, we're raising rents before we even do anything to the units because the rents are so much under under market um, so there's definitely a, a big management upside you should try to find if, in these properties and then sometimes you don't find a management upside but you find a cosmetic upside meaning the units are like a hundred percent classic and you could renovate those to a premium level um, any other questions? Any other questions? Uh, is there any big difference between four units and 100 plus units? So, Augustin, my recommendation is to not do anything under 50 units. And the reason behind that is because the larger you go, the easier it gets. Because when you go into a larger property over 50 units, what happens is the property management companies are all of a sudden way, way, way better than anything you could get on a four unit or a five unit deal. And then the other thing is you could have employees that literally work on site and live on site on the property. So like the last deal we just bought, we have two employees that live on the property and I never have to go see it in person. Obviously I do from time to time. My partner lives in Dallas and he sees it now every two weeks, but we don't have to do that because we have people that live on site. If there's a problem, they'll take care of it immediately. Uh, versus if I have a four unit and you know there's a problem, then they have to send somebody from their office to go check it out. And if they don't have someone available, then things could get delayed. So I will tell you this based on my experience, going after larger properties is actually easier than going after smaller properties. Hope that helps. Any other questions, anybody? Post them in the chat, happy to answer any questions. No? Okay, cool. All right, cool. So let's go back to this. So, so the, this is these are some tips that I have for you as you're starting to do deals and as you're doing due diligence. And that is number one is you want to be very attentive to details. Um, if you would have noticed throughout this, basically we're going line by line on the financials. We're going line by line on the rent roll. We're looking for little cracks in the walls. We're looking for you know AC units on the windows. We're looking for uh, Google reviews, right? So like these are little details that the average person just doesn't focus on, and that's why they get in trouble. Um, so you want to make sure that you focus on the little details because those details are basically where you could lose money or make money on a deal. Um, another big tip that I have for you is that you should have a 15 to 20% contingency in your rehab costs. So what I mean by that is, let's say I, you know, I'm looking at a deal and I say, hey, we're going to spend half a million dollars, right, to renovate it. I'm going to add in an extra hundred thousand dollars on top of that, just as a contingency in case I run into a problem that I did not expect to run into. Because 
the truth is every property there's going to be things that you just don't account for and, and so you want to make sure you have a contingency plan you also want to make sure that you have that in there just in case things get more expensive like maybe you buy a property and you get the quote and you're thinking hey i'm going to spend ten thousand dollars per unit to renovate but then you know wood gets more expensive and you know kitchen appliances get more expensive and then all of a sudden now your cost of 10,000 goes up to 12,000. Well, no problem. You've already accounted for a 20% contingency as a part of that. Um, you want to build out the business plan and the rehab plan prior to getting under contract because at that point, this is when you could understand how much money you need to spend. That's when you put in your contingency plan. You do not do that after getting under contract. At that point, it's, it's just way too late. So make sure that when you walk through the property, what we do is like, we just have an Excel sheet and we write down, hey, you know, we need to spend X amount of money on, on the foundation. We might need to spend X amount of money on the AC. We might need to spend X amount of money on the paint of, of the exterior. We, we're gonna renovate 50 units and they're each gonna cost 10 grand, right? So you build out your entire business plan prior to getting under contract. Um, and then, you know, again, rely on your property management company to do inspections and the financial auditing because they know how to do this way better than you will ever know how to do it. So just rely on their experience, rely on their team, they, you know, and they will do, uh, especially if you choose a management company that, that is large, like, you know, maybe they 